This is Writers Not Writing, the show where you can get to know your favorite writers and soon-to-be favorite writers by listening to them confess to the ways they procrastinate. Thanks for procrastinating with us. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff. Doug tries his best to make me sound better. And each week we have a secret word to listen for. If you catch it, you earn the right to take an extra break at the time of your choosing from whatever is stressing you out. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Today's secret word is phlebotomist. Welcome, everyone. Today's guest is Elle Mitchell. Elle Mitchell is a multidisciplinary artist and author of raw, character-driven dark fiction. She spends her downtime ignoring new story ideas, fighting for disability rights, researching, and eating more than her share of homemade baked goods when her body allows. Being a woman with several invisible illnesses, she enjoys living a semi-horizontal life with her husband and spoiled furbits in the Pacific Northwest. Welcome, Elle. I've been very excited to have you on the show. Um, so thank you very much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. So the folks on YouTube can already see our costumes, but I want to make sure that for the folks on the podcasts, we explain what it is we're wearing. We always dress up in costume. So for the podcast listeners, tell everybody what you chose to wear today. Okay. I'd be happy to. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm sad. You can't see it. It is a masterpiece from the famous designer Quinn Verna, which Obviously, her collection. Mwah. It's sea creatures, okay? Iridescent lucite shoes that resemble sort of ruby slippers. A pink taffeta slip dress with a clear vinyl circle skirt and emerald vinyl bralette over top. They're a testament to what complicated fabrics can do when they're put together. Oh, but the piece de resistance is the headpiece. Okay, a two foot wide bubble filled with perfectly unpopped soap bubbles. How she does it, I'll never know. And two, two blobfish in their own small bubble ecosystems surround the clear glass helmet on my head. It's surrealist art in reality. Yeah. If only the podcast listeners could see this too. Uh, I'd share a photo with you all, but alas, Miss Verna says it is only to be seen live. To capture her work with a picture is to capture souls, she says. So wow. Well, the 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 YouTube viewers are very very lucky. That is wild. Those blobfish are alive, aren't they? They're actually moving they around in there. That is that is amazing. Well, I I had to way step up my game. I've, I you know normally do not go go this elaborate, but uh, uh, I'm I'm wearing the same outfit worn by Andre Leon uh, Tally at the Met Gala in 2004. Uh, that year's exhibit was Dangerous Liaisons, Fashion and Furniture in the 18th Century. And so th this thing is, it's enormous. So it's this huge, uh, uh, you know, it, it starts off in the shoulders and then goes full length. And then the sleeves are very long and wide and have uh, the, the this ruffle that comes out underneath. Uh, and then he's got a, you know, I, I've got this, I've got this tie on uh, and, you know, a, a simple collar. So it almost looks old fashioned. It looks a cross between a, a, a you know huge gown and a couch cover. I think maybe the the the, the furniture and fashion uh, aspect met in this uh, in this really brave way. I will tell you all, it is very hard to sit in this. This was designed to stand and and walk down a red carpet, and I feel like I am just uh, ballooning out here. But uh, but it's 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 quite a statement. So. Um, yeah, the, the folks on, on YouTube have got to be just loving this. But uh, those of you listening to the podcast, just imagine I'm basically a couch uh, right now, an 18th century, very ornate couch. So uh, I've been really excited to get to talk to you about um, the uh, uh, presentation you did at Willamette Writers. Uh, so what is it that, uh, tell everybody about this, the, the uh, presentation you did and how this is going to be moving further into some other work you're going to be doing. Okay. So the workshop, um, was about writing disabilities and trauma and fiction. Uh, first 
I'm just going to throw out that I was super humbled by the fact that people actually just showed up in the first place to listen to me speak. I definitely thought it was just going to be, you know, my husband who drove me and a couple of friends, but uh, they did. The room was closed to it being a full event, which was like uh, 24 people. Um, oh, and I should and- tell you afterwards, they were raving. It was a huge hit. They, yeah, they got, so yeah, sorry. Tell everybody about it. It was really cool. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm still, I'm still buzzy. I, I had a couple of people, they were like, I tried, we just listened outside. And I was like, oh no, would you like to call me? I'll give you the whole presentation. Right. <laughs> it was, um, it was, it was beautiful. I mean, I fit 40 minutes of what I'm going to turn into like a four to eight hour course on the topic, because how do you fit this? I mean, it's, that's happening in 2024. So, you know, we'll get there, but, uh, I'm trying. Um, But in the meantime, and for this course, I tried to hit some of the high points, um, really driving home uh, research and uh, where to find the reliable places, getting multiple perspectives from real people, watching interviews, that kind of thing, and taking the fact that these are real marginalized communities into consideration, which it's really easy to forget when you sit down behind your computer and you're writing fiction, especially. you... And I stepped on you and you were going to tell everybody what the actual topic was. I ran over the title of the, the uh, workshop. So what was it about? Oh, um, so it's basically when you are writing fiction and you want to put people with disability or uh, people with different kinds of trauma into it when you want to weave their stories or them as characters. A lot of time people um, have this fear that only people with lived experience can do that properly. As someone with a lot of lived experience, I wholeheartedly disagree. I know that that is a hot take for some people, which is fair, totally. But, you know, not everybody with this lived experience wants to write. So we want to see our stories nonetheless, you yes, know? Yes, I mean, that's the issue. If only people with that lived experience write that experience, the there will not, the, the representation then disappears. And so how can people who don't have that lived experience do that with, you know, do justice and and depict people accurately and, and you know, not in a, yeah. But uh, yeah, I agree. I think that's really important to stretch ourselves beyond our own lived experience for the sake of having characters that all of our readers see themselves in. Exactly. And it's really, it's easy to accidentally come off with like an ick feeling or exploitative or make flat characters um, because we lie to our readers. That's our job. Supernatural powers, instant love. That's that's what we do. Our readers expect that. But, you know, when it comes to marginalized communities, you have to be a little more realistic because when people walk away from your stories, they're not going to think that supernatural power is real, but they may think that's what that chronic illness looks like. That's how mm-hmm. trauma shows up. They might not, you know, but for those people that do, you want them to think of you as an authority. And that comes with responsibilities. Um, Misinformation is really easy to spread. I mean, not going to get into politics, but hello, politics, right? Right. One lie, whoosh, right? So I, I started with this massive document that I gave people that was filled with uh, (laughs) tons of accurate research places so you don't just google because that's a mess so it's got medical websites even all the way down to video games that accurately represent you know emotions that you can play through um and a list of gripes from marginalized communities of things that you see in uh, fiction that are really bothersome because there are a lot um and we did prom. We we like had prompts where I had people write from different marginalized community, uh, where they just were literally writing going into a coffee shop because the way we move through the world is different. And I that was one of the biggest parts that I wanted to drive home is you know though it's really easy to say person in a wheelchair. Okay, I said it once and now we're moving on, but that's not our life. We don't just walk oh 
Yeah. yeah I've seen wheelchair users walk into rooms in a book. Um, we're going to need to explain how that happens. Um, but we don't just get into a building. There are ways we have to get into buildings. There are ways we have to exist to get into cars, ways people look at us, ways we feel when we move. And not that you have to just constantly drag your reader down because sometimes it really sucks to be somebody with the trauma and chronic illness, but you do have to make sure that that's represented throughout your entire book. And, you know, it, talking about it with these people and and the writers in the room they had really lovely questions it was a really wholesome experience and afterwards uh people came up and they said really lovely things it was their favorite course i had someone came and we honestly we talked for like 15 minutes and they were like i think this was kind of a a one on one course just for me and yeah. it was you know we talked about their book in particular and i helped them through some stuff but it seemed to invigorate the writers, even during the prompts, like at the end of five minutes, I was like, <clears throat> oh, guys, it ended up being more like almost 10 minutes per time. because I had to keep reminding people, but they were just in it. Yeah. They were just so excited in the flow. And, and they just, all of what they said, I didn't have very many comments. I expected to have to really break down work. I only had one comment for one person and it was such an easy fix. Everybody was just really listening and it was, it was just really, it was lovely. Honestly, it was, it was more than I could have possibly imagined. Well, and I, I love that you've got the, um, the, you know, the kind of the common gripes too from different communities, because I found that really useful. There are things that we can put into our books that are true and we don't know. Yeah, this might be true, but it is so overdone that people in the community are like, yeah, you, you, you are relaying a very real thing that you read in a book once, but it's in my life a thousand times and it has become a cliche. You need to know, don't do that anymore. And so I found those really, really helpful. What were some of those that, that jumped out at folks that are the kind of tired cliches that people are going, I am, I, I, I'm sick of seeing that in my literature? Actually, we didn't get into the cliches. That's not what people wanted to talk about with the grant. The the people were fine. I mean, most of the marginalized communities that I spoke with, and I went on multiple websites, and I I just could have put out a call. Um, I said, I'm calling it I effing hate it when um dot 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 yeah. fill in the blank, please. And people were like, honestly, I hate it when people don't recognize that my wheelchair is a part of me yeah. and they put their hands on it and there's no response. I'm just moved about the cabin and there's no commentary on the page that that might elicit fear or that I would have to recognize the person's perfume or something behind me before I would have a thought because you're basically moving a person, a human right. person. You, grab you don't person put your arms around a person and move them. Yeah. That's weird. But that happens in books a lot, even if it's just like a sentence, but it's also just a sentence to say, whoa, buddy, basically, yeah. you know, Don't do this. It's yeah. super weird. And another one was um, about um, hearing impaired people where uh, they all cannot hear anything. The end. Um, or it sounds like an ocean. Uh and so one woman, she's like, no, here are actually some resources of what it sounds like that I got at a medical conference, um, because that's really annoying. I am considered 99% deaf and can still hear noise. So And not the ocean. It doesn't right, sound like the this ocean. This is not what it sounds like. And so I yeah. listened to it and I was like, okay, I'm going to be honest. Now, I have never said what these people say, but I did not know this. This yeah. was eye opening. Um, but it was usually things like that where it was it, it feels like it's so simple to just research, like after five seconds of research on real research websites, right. on accurate medical websites, it all of these things are dispelled. And yeah. that's how simple it is. Or um, the uh, emotions that come with um, falling in love seem to be portrayed very differently for disabled people um in i i didn't realize that i actually i've only seen a few books with chronic illness and i'm gonna be super honest i have stayed away from them because their synopsis uh they have 
that have not felt nice to me. So I'm like, oh, okay, she's going to do 35 things this week because she's falling apart. And all of them are going to be just like jumping on in. And I'm like, yeah. And none of them involve telling her partner that she has this thing. Ooh, yeah, yeah, that's not real. Um, You would not get a brand new partner and be like all in on this relationship and forget to mention that you are going to be going to the hospital for, you know, blood infusions next week. Like you're not, if, if you, if iron infusions are in your future, well, as someone who's had them, they're a pretty big deal. You're going to tell someone. So it's little things like that, that it's, it's again, sentences, but those sentences for us, are everything because that's our life, you know? Well, I, I have noticed I stay away from books where it's about terminal illnesses because I feel like the authors are using that as a way to go, here's insta tragedy. And instead of, okay, chronic illness is someone someone lives with and their life is not tragic. And so how can we tell stories of somebody living with an illness rather than just, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're falling in love with only this many weeks left to, you know, and I'm like, ah, no, the, you know, the, the terminal illness thing is, which is not to say those aren't stories that should be told, but yeah, they're, they're, they're not for me because I often feel like the author's being lazy. That is actually one of the things I talked about is um, using, I, I think using and utilizing are both great words when it comes to symptoms of what's happening. Totally. But if you are doing it for reasons that are strictly to manipulate Yes, I think you should manipulate your reader, but if the only purpose is manipulation, not as a part of the story, then there's a problem because that's, you don't do that with able-bodied people. Um, Like, hi, this person is straight, so I'm going to make you, uh, I guess you can't really do that, but you do it with queer people and you do it with disabled people. And if you can take the core of a, person's situation. I mean, I'm not saying disability is myself, but that's kind of the point is like, you're taking a part of me and you're making it me. And I'm not, I'm a disabled person. Well, it speaks a lot to our sense of what is the cultural default that we are promoting where we're like, oh, this person's, you know, cishet male whiteness is, is not their character that, you know, for them, they get a, they get a full character. But everybody right. else, we can say, oh, they're the fact that they're a person of color, or the fact that they have disability, or they're you know they're queer, is their character. That wouldn't be for a cis hat white guy. You wouldn't go, and the character is a guy. Like right. we would all right away go, that's not a character yet. So yeah, that's uh, that. Yeah, I've, I've absolutely seen that. Yeah. <laughs> so you also have a, a book of your own work coming out soon. Yes, I do. Um, it is. <laughs> very unique uh short story collection coming out on one of my favorite days october friday the 13th i mean those come around so very very seldom that i was very excited um this one has uh, 62 short stories um they're anywhere from poems to flash fiction to traditional like couple thousand words um each one has a miniature accompanying it and there's like Uh a photograph of the miniature in the world. Um, It started as a mental health project. I basically had a ton of book ideas just floating on the computer. And one day had a full on come apart and was like, I'm never going to write these before I die. Uh, Whatever. I'm pretty young to be having this feeling, but I have those. Yeah. Sometimes you do. And also I'll be honest, my hands are failing me. They dislocate and sublux all the time. Mm. And so I just had a lot of feelings. So I decided that, you know what, instead of trying to make these into full stories of like big, massive things, I was just gonna smoosh them and tell as much as I felt like I could tell. And then whatever was left, turn them into miniatures. And so it just vomited out. And I actually was not going to show anyone, but my friend was like, um, you might as well, you're already turning it into a something for you. So I stopped the book I was working on, vomited all these things, turned it into this tiny thing and hacked and slashed. (laughs) And then it is now this fun little thing. It's like this big, it's so small and it is 
just a delight. It's so yeah. weird. It's got and when you say miniatures, from... what do you mean? What, what do you mean by the, the minute? I mean, is it a single object of art or is it like a diorama y thing? Or what are we talking yes, about? Yes, yes, yes. From feathers, like a collection of bloody feathers, that's the smallest thing, to um miniature TV set in front of um a little bloody couch, um, all the way to a full room with portals. Um, that's like, you know, the 12 by 12 there's, it's across the board and there's, and and it's all over the pictures have been taken all over, um, Washington and Oregon, um, from my backyard to, you know, a laundromat in Beaverton. It's just all over the place. And it, it became like this exciting thing. It, It was just like, it was beyond a project. It just, it was it was just so much fun. I was calling places all around me like, hey, can I, I don't know, uh, take a picture of your business? And they're yeah. like, for what? And I'm like, I'm just going to sit on your floor and just like lay around with like a pillow under me and just do weird things. Is that cool? And they're like, I, yeah, I guess, sure. Yes. And then they're just like sitting like this, like watching me with their like <laughs> gently as if I'm just the most fascinating thing. And yeah, it was, it was really strange, but it just, it, it felt like I was releasing this stress and tension and anxiety in this really beautiful, creative way. And as soon as I like let them all go, I just felt this huge weight off my chest. I was able to finish my other book and now I've already started another one of these Wow! with all so of these really other was. ideas that pop up. Through. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, it was like the cork, like you just had to get past this enormous project, but it sounds really cool. It's, it's wonderful. And I, I highly suggest anybody that's getting stuck with a bunch of ideas, do find their thing. Not, this isn't going to be everybody's thing, but whatever your thing is, just do it. I had a lot of help with my therapist to get to this point. I will be honest, my therapist being like, um, yeah, so you are thinking of quitting writing entirely because of the things. And I'm like, yeah, honestly, just screw everything. And she's like, well, because you have too many ideas. Do yeah. you hear yourself? And I'm like, yes, I yeah. do. And, but where else do you go from here? Well, and also, I mean, if the, you know, if the fear is that your hands are betraying you and then you're doing these miniatures, which are, I would think, very demanding of your hands <laughs> in and of themselves, it, you know, really wasn't the hands i mean the hands is a very legitimate more long-term fear right but like that's a I mean, folks do who don't know you don't know about all of your other art besides your writing but uh you know tell everybody about the jewelry you make because i love your stuff it's very very cool well thank you so first yes you are right they are very hard on my hands that is actually part of the the mental health part was um, compartmentalizing my time and where I put my mental energy because I noticed I was sitting down and I was like, okay, I need to do the writer thing. I need to sit down. Mm -hmm. I need to write thousands of words today. And tomorrow I got to write thousands of words and I have a deadline, but like, I mean, my deadline is super self-imposed. I'm self-published. Part of the reason I started self-publishing is for me in the first place. So technically if I didn't publish for seven years, I'm literally only not publishing for me. And I love that Um, being disabled. That's, you know, it's okay. I should be doing that. I should be taking care of myself. So I actually would do like a miniature and then like the next day I might not even write. I would just, you know, veg out, let my hands ice or whatever Um, because art is so important to me. The, the jewelry you're talking about, I actually make multiple kinds of jewelry, but one of my, most popular jewelry is disarticulated Barbies. <laughs> um, I tear it's them apart. With and bones. I love that. They, uh, yeah, they have, they have um, bones. I buy <laughs> from um, this. There's a couple different Etsy places, but they're all people that go on like long, long hikes and find bones in the woods and bleach them and everything. So ethically sourced, but yeah. I take them and I insert them where the joints were or like, you know, pretend that they're little ballet skirts instead of hip bones. And uh, yeah, I'm actually selling them in October for the first time. Yeah, I usually don't sell the ones with bones, but I'm finally going to try it, see what happens. But yeah, I I just recently did my first uh, piece with my own blood. Uh, Not 
creepily, I accidentally cut myself and thought, okay, well, it's bleeding a lot. It was my hand. And I was like, well, is it weird to collect this? It was deemed yes by my husband. Um, It was deemed no by me. So I just got a little (laughs) ramekin, filled it while he was like trying to compress my hand. And I was like, we're having different goals right now. I remember but seeing it this was on, beautiful. It was on like a beautiful Twitter piece. threads and I was like, this is fine once, but don't make a habit of this. Please don't do this on purpose. <laughs> that is what my therapist said. Yeah. I told my therapist I just needed to go to a phlebotomist. And then she laughed and said, no phlebotomist would give me what I wanted. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, that is very cool. That's exciting. So how are you? Are you going to do Etsy for the sales of those as well? Um, I... I think I'm probably just going to put them on my website because I don't really have the energy to like advertise another thing, but you know, I'll let people know that I do it. And then, you know, if they're interested, hooray. And if not, that's okay. I don't, I don't do this for other people. I've never, I don't even write for other people, which is why I actually have like four books that are actively completely done and I have done nothing with them. And I don't know if I ever will. It's almost one of those, like if a publisher came and was like, do you have books for me? I'd be like, yeah, sure. You can have them. Um, Yep. yep. Because I don't really care. I just don't have the energy to do all the things. Um, So I feel like that's the way it is with my art. I have, I mean, all of the 62 miniatures are actually not all. I have like another 15 just around that I've done for no reason. I, no one knows what they look like except my husband because I just made them. And then now they're in a drawer. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I'm hopeful that people will go, this is the time to get the book and this piece, you know, I mean, it'll be the same time period. So it could be a good, uh, a good promotion to go, I've got this jewelry and, oh, I have a new book out right now at the same time in October that, uh, is exciting. Okay. Well, we've been already talking about all these cool things that you're doing as part of your work, but it's a show about procrastination. So what is something that has been pulling you away from your writing in terms of entertainment in the last week? Oh my gosh. It's not even the last week. It's the last lots of times. Australian dating shows. Okay. No, not even Australian, just dating shows, but usually not American. Okay. Love Island. I don't know if you've heard about it. It is a mess. There's a UK version we just found and we're a couple episodes in. Wow, that is the most garbage. Season one, you just wonder, why are you watching this? It's the worst. It's the most sexist. I mean, is it like, this is just, you know, we're throwing these people into a disaster waiting to happen and you're just watching it going, what? Yeah, it's like Big Brother with relationships. They keep pairing people off. And then they're like, you have to choose each other. And you're like, but I thought you were supposed to be like what, at least in the US version, they have challenges, but they all are like fear factor where they have to run and jump and eat gross things, which why I can't even watch the gross things. I have to fast forward through that because that's vile on a next level. I don't know why I'm watching it. I really don't. It's so bad. We talk through the whole thing. I'm crafting. I'm like, doing the laundry. I do not understand this about myself. I don't. I I talked to my friend and I I told her I was doing this and I was like, I don't get it. I'm not ashamed, but I do wonder what's going on. And she goes, okay, so me too. And I was like, which one? And she goes, the Australian Love Island. What's wrong with us? (laughs) And I was like, I don't know. I got a VPN like last year and you have to use a VPN to watch this garbage. I am actively seeking it out. I have a problem. But then yeah. I told my therapist and she was like, well, and I was like, no, no. It's the only thing I know about her is that she also watches this garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I've been seeing her for years and she's a great therapist. So I don't know her life because yeah. you shouldn't know your therapist's right. life. Except now I know that she also watches garbage dating shows. And I was like, I think that I love you more. Uh, yes, that and you also, also like, watch this crappy. Yeah, and also like, uh, if I use our whole session to talk about this show, that's that's I still have to pay for that, right? Like, we're not just buddies talking about Australian Love Island, right? I have to tell you, I would be fine to pay for a whole session of talking about Love Island. <laughs> I'm sure there are full podcasts. Like all these shows have, you know, people just dissecting them because they are they're almost more fun to dissect than to just experience. Like watching them alone would be weird. Like the fact that you're, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the talking to them. Yeah. Is a lot of the fun is, you know, the, the, there, there's a podcast I have listened to for the bachelor without watching the bachelor because the people who are dissecting it are so much fun. Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh. I would, I would like host a married at first sight 
Like yep. the 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 Australian one, honestly, the US is garbage, but the Australian one has dinner parties where everyone gets together and they all yell at each other about things that are happening. Oh my God. It's 44 episodes. You should totally do it. Do a podcast. Oh my God. I would totally, all by myself. I would just be yelling into the camera about how ridiculous this show is. You and your husband could do it where he's just going like, I can't believe we're doing this. And you're like, no, I've got to explain this to everyone. And then your audience would be, you know, people like me who don't have the VPN who are like, now I need to understand this. I can't watch it myself. Elle's got to explain all of this. And I, I'm I'm sort of with her husband. Like, why why are we watching this? And then you're like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, it's you madness. wouldn't be with my husband because my husband loves it as much as I. Okay, yeah, yeah. Does he, he pretend he doesn't, or is he totally into it? Oh no, he's fine with it. No, okay, we're good. both we're both in. Uh, there is literally I don't know how many times either of us have watched a show and been like, nope, turn it off. And we both look at each other and almost the exact same time go, they don't have dinner parties. Yeah. Yeah. Because like an Australian dinner party is like integral to a like a dating show. So this this one, like Love Island, they don't have they don't have that. So you talk through it more because yeah. like a dating a dating show without a dinner party is like it's just not as good. So like Married at First Sight, the fact that there isn't a Married at First Sight on right now is like it it's really sad to my soul. I feel like there should be one every single day of the year. And then <laughs> I feel like I would always be less productive, but very happy. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the balance that I've had to find is I'm like, I should be working right now. You know, Crystal get me sucked into shows where I'm like, I'm going to pretend I'm hating this the entire time. And she's like, you are fooling no one. So like, she got me into a Bridgerton and I was like, I'm not watching Bridgerton. Oh yeah. I totally watched all of Bridgerton. It's like, wait, you can't watch it without me. Like I would walk in and she's watching it, and I'm like, uh, hold on. I, when you suck me into this, it worked. I need to watch this show now. And I'm like, I am far less productive. And also this is, this is good family time. We're watching Bridgerton together. <laughs> like you call it family time. Is that your way of saying, I actually really love it, but if I call it family time, I feel better? Yeah, I feel, I feel like, no, okay, I'm being productive. I'm investing in my relationship. It's not just that, that I'm watching Bridgerton. <laughs> I'm fooling no one. Like nobody is deceived by this at all. I love that. <laughs> so uh, what's been going on in the news that's been pulling you away from your work? So... It's like not regular news. It's actually um, a forensic, some forensic articles. I um, I get forensic mag, like their, you know, online articles, easy thing. What is that called? I don't know. The thing they send you in your email that always go to yeah, promotion they're... and you're really mad because you keep telling it to go to your regular inbox because I like to delete everything in my promotions. Um, but apparently there's um, this interesting thing about duct tape ev- evidence and the proverbial they are working on a new way to examine it better um and identify the physical fit so it's not only gonna consistently hold up in court but be more accurate um and i love to hear that the forensic and scientific community um is like non-stop trying to keep the innocent out of jail because i have like some feelings i visited a jail during a citizens academy once and so like you know you watch the shows and you think you know right and you're like oh i'm enraged and then you go and then you're sickened and you're mad and you go home and cry and you're like i didn't know i mean i knew but i didn't know and then you wonder if you should change your entire life and just work for the Innocence Project. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you realize that that it actually takes expertise you don't have. And oh, yeah, so that's where I was after I went. And so whenever I hear things like this, I'm like, yes, thank you. So like I had to like go down a rabbit hole of like how many things it's it's gone wrong with it and where they are and like make sure I bookmark new things that it's going to, you know, affect soon and so, yeah, I was super happy to be taken away from everything for that because that felt really good. <laughs> yeah. And when you say duct tape evidence, what is the so this is literally related to duct tape, like how long the duct tape has been on this particular thing. And so that yeah. they could say this person didn't do this because this duct tape was in this place for longer or. And also like the actual when it tears to prove that this particular tear came from this particular like actual roll of duct tape because the actual shredding is that's what they mean by physical fit. The actual individual pieces make 
an identification, just like a shoe print or whatever. Yeah. But the thing is, is technically, if you think about it, don't they all kind of shred the same? But apparently, my, micro, yeah. they do not. And so now they've got this... Um, They've got this new technology that they're working on so that they can like down to the teensy tiniest level, they can go in and say no. And including finding like tiny microfibers and stuff inside. It's, it's, it's very fascinating and it's still early days, but um, the fact that someone is actively working on this, considering duct tape is so common in crime because it's so easy to get a hold of. I mean, that obviously means people are going to start changing to something else. But, you know, at least the people that don't know this information, which will be plenty of people because so many people choose not to research before they do crime. Thank goodness. Right. So those people will get caught to to, you know, to to uh, veer into the political because I'm, you know, it's it's my show. We can do that. Um, You'll uh, never hear me complain. Yeah, I uh, uh, I have visited a couple of. carceral facilities i've taught some classes in uh you know in them and you're right i mean it, it, it is it is horrifying uh and and part of what is horrifying is how much of it is really medical and should not be being treated in this way and you're just you know that we're not treating people we're punishing people and it's it's scary but uh i just saw yesterday that uh cory bush has some uh, a proposal for some pretty massive legislation that would invest a ton of money in researching ways to make, you know, how do we identify the better systems that are more focused on rehabilitative systems? And often, you know, it's medical systems. How do we make sure that people are getting the care that they need, both to avoid putting them in prison in the first place, and then to treat them better once they are in prison? So folks, if you are interested, check out Cory Bush's legislation, support that, because, uh, yeah, the, the fact that we wow. lock up more people than than uh, China, a nation that should have three times as many people, uh, you know, if if we were being fair, and that's assuming the Chinese government is fair, which it is not. Uh, you know, we sh- we should not be leading the, the world in in incarcerating people. So uh, that's uh, that. Yeah, that I'm I'm hopeful that there's some progress being made and people recognizing this. There there is a deep deep problem uh, in the way that we just throw them away and you know lock them up and throw away the key as as a a way of dealing with social ills i mean that's fantastic seeing the drunk tank was so upsetting they were like peek through the window and i peek through you know you almost don't want to and you i there was not a person in that that should have been in there i'm like it takes me no time at all to identify mentally ill yep human beings i'm like that's all that's in there this yeah. is mental illness how do you not see this how well, is anyone yeah. in here drunk and or on drugs what are you i i don't even, even know necessarily is. how to identify that on like a you know psychological level but it it's not it's not abnormal it's clear it's very yeah. clear well and even if somebody is drunk or on drugs they're self-medicating for a reason right so exactly why is this person in so much pain that they've decided i need this you know, heroin, or I need to be uh, numbed by alcohol. Well, can we address the root cause of why this person feels they need to be numbed rather than throwing them into a room with a bunch of other people who are self-medicating for different reasons? Like then these people are essentially torturing one another. Uh, And yeah, it's, it's, if anybody stepped away from it, they would go, this is not a solution. Like, you know, this is, this is madness. It only works once you're in it and you're going, this is just the way we do it. Like, no, this is not good. No, it's terrible, especially because I um I won't get on my soapbox about chronic pain, but I've known too many people that have had their uh full all of their medications taken away. My sister is on seven medications and she's still not out of pain and they have threatened to take all of them away. And I'm like, I don't what? And so to me, I'm like yeah, I'll help you get street drugs. Right. What else are you going to do? So, you know, I yeah, and that's easy that's the wrong. way that it could lead to that. How could it not? Now, yeah. um, if anyone sees this, <clears throat> I did not say that. There are no street drugs in mm-hmm. the direction of my family. I don't know what you're talking about. You wouldn't even know where to. You're just saying you'd be. No, you're right. I really wouldn't, especially because it's not even in the state. But still, it's just like, that's how easy it is. It's just, what are you going to do next? There is there is no next, you know? Yeah, well, we push people into it. And, you know, I, I know Crystal has struggled with... Uh, uh, there's been a, a shortage of uh, an ADHD medication 
And the rationale is, well, some people are abusing it. Well, other people need it. And don't tell them, oh, sorry, there's a shortage. Like, you can't just go, sorry, we don't have this medication. You need to function. Oh, it's just not there. Like, that is, yeah. Then do better and make more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, rather than addressing a problem by saying, we'll just deny everyone this needed medication so that some people don't abuse it. Like, that that's not a real solution. So, yeah. That's garbage. Um, so hobbies, when you're not doing hard drugs that you found on the streets. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What's a, uh, what's a, what's a hobby that you've been getting into? And you already mentioned the miniatures. Uh, what else have you been doing? Um, so pretty much crafts are just like, that's my hobby though. I, I have been tinkering with like a lot of games. Like I, I'm a gamer. I'm an avid gamer again. Like uh, what? I thought you said your hands were bad. You right. Uh, this right, comes yeah. down to compartmentalizing and choosing what you want to do with choosing your, bed. your pain. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> choosing where I want to, to put my energy. So I've tinkered with a lot of different games and, um, have mostly settled on apex legends at the moment. Um, Oh, if you have not played. Well, that's that's I, Noah's. He's got, you know, friends that he's playing with and they're like, today it's Apex. And they are, yep, it is many, many hours of Apex. It's me and the hubs. And uh, uh, when I first decided to play, he'd been playing for like two years. He was like, okay, so we should go to the training grounds and like get you familiar with the stuff. And I was like, sure, sure, sure. So we go to the training grounds for like a couple of seconds. I pick, pick up the gun. I'm like, boom, boom, boom. And he's like, I don't know why I thought we needed to do this. And I was like, I also did not. We've played Borderlands and everything. And I'm like, you know, we'll, I, it'll be harder when the people are jumping around that have been doing this since the game came out, for sure. Um, but yeah, we are really, we're good at this game. And it is a lot of fun. And so <laughs> we literally, as soon too? as he gets off work, I'm like, want to play Apex? <laughs> yeah. Had you played Titanfall 2? I haven't. Actually, I up until yesterday, I kid you not, yesterday. I did not know it was related, yeah. but I was like, I would really love a story mode because they did this really cool thing with just this tiny little instance with one of the characters in Apex. And I was like, I think it'd be really cool if there was a story with these characters. And the hubs is like, um, there are two games. And I'm like, so you're saying we have two games to play. And he goes, you just bought the entirety of Bioshock to play. And I'm like, and also we're going to play these. And yeah. he's like, Right. So we're not going to have any time in our life. And I'm like, well, we were like, we played WoW. WoW was our game until the stuff. I do not play games associated to sexual predators. So we dropped it like a bad habit. Boom. Mm. So we were like, what are we going to fill our time with? So we played a ton of different games and none of them really fit. And this is just the one. And I, I never mind playing a single person game back and forth, like trading the controller so you can yell at each other to do right. things and mess everyone up because that's apparently super fun for me being like, oh, did I get you killed? <laughs> I'll take over from here because you should have done better. Yeah. He says to me as well, this is an equal opportunity thing. So I yes. look forward to trying the Titanfall games. Yes, try it. It is, it is. Uh, and Titanfall 2 is significantly better like one you could tell they were going we're getting the kind of mechanics of this worked out so the story is pretty ancillary it's not like it. titanfall 2 has legit characters you like and a story that is fun uh, you know the, the only real significant difference between it and apex in terms of gameplay is you've got what you're doing uh as as a as a character in apex you're a pilot and then as you you know acquire points, eventually you can earn the giant mech robot that falls down and then you're battling with robots. And then your robot dies and you're back to being your Apex pilot. But otherwise it's, yeah, it's it's Apex plus giant robot plus a good story. So yeah, yeah, you know, slog through uh, uh, Titanfall 1 and then you'll love Titanfall 2. It's really fun. <laughs> this is all very exciting. I think I'll do this before Bioshock. I just bought Bioshock the series yesterday because it was like, it's 80% off the whole series yesterday. And I was like, Ooh, it's really hard not to um, jump in on is that. It game pass? Is it, is that why it's. Uh, I do not know why it is. Okay. It might be a few more hours. So yeah. I don't know, but it was just like $12 for the entirety of the series. And I was like, okay, well, I've wanted to try the first one. This is still cheaper than the first one. So I guess I'll just buy the whole series. And if it isn't good, then well, 
chalk it up to a bad movie because it's still cheaper than that. Right. So yeah, well, and that's one where I've gone, I don't know that I can invest the time. Like, it's a lot, you know, It's a, but people who have played it, love, I mean, they rave. They just love it. So I'm like, maybe I should. So yeah. I'll, well, have I'll to, report I'll have back to... and then you'll get jealous and want to play. Yes, I'll have to. Yeah, let me know what you think. If you say it's well told, then I'm like, oh, I'll have to try it out. <laughs> So part of the point of the show is for uh, readers to get to know you so they can go, oh, yeah, I want to read more of your books. And so I always ask folks uh, about if you were a and d character, so not, not a and d character you would play, but if you yourself, if El Mitchell were in a and d game, what would be your race and class? Okay, so pardon me if I mispronounce this. I am a lot of kind of gamers, but D&D is one I have not addressed yet, though let me just be real clear and say that I have tried to get a D&D group together, but like, why is that so hard? I can get it online, but I have to tell you, if I'm not going to be able to dress up and be like a proper dork, by the way, that is a compliment. Um, if I'm not going to be able to be a proper dork, costume, everything, like we're going to make fancy foods that are related to our yes. characters. If that's not happening, I'm not in. Um, and I have not found anyone that's like all willing to go in. See, I so. haven't been able to find somebody who's willing to DM because it's an incredible amount of, you know, work that you do. And I'm like, I would love to play a good D&D game, but I don't want to DM because I've got novels to write. And so, yes. like, hey, will you please work for me uh, so I can play this game? See, yes, yes. That's yeah. what I'm also looking for. I know a few other people that would be like, oh, yeah, I'll totally make snacks and we have costumes and stuff. But oh, like writing a whole campaign. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like write a mini book because yeah. I won't. Yeah. So, yep. Good luck. <laughs> but if I find that DM, I'll let you know. We will, I will be, because I agree. Costumes, yeah. snacks, that's key. Yes, yes. Okay, do let me know. Um. So like I said, if I pronounce this wrong, uh, do forgive me because I am trying. Um. The Herringon Monk, that is that is what I'm going with. Uh, a adorable the the idea of blessed with fey luck now let's be clear that is not actually me that is my hopeful self so this is the idealistic like oh my gosh fortunate from danger no we're i'm a spoonie we all know that's not real so this is the fingers crossed version of yes. me so the monk however the idea of you know sending people real in by knocking them over and healing people. Now that is true because I will hit someone with my cane. And I do like to think that I'm a very healing person emotionally and physically because I'm always there for my friends and I am always here to listen. And, you know, I try to, to put people out or put characters out in the world that make people feel seen as well as just in general, um, put stories and uh, creative nonfiction that, you know, is emotionally healing for people. Yesterday, I actually published an article about my mast cell activation syndrome. Um, basically, it's my food journey. I lost like a ton of weight as I was figuring out that I was allergic to a lot of things. And I already got a couple emails of people being like, wow, so I'm not alone. And I'm like, nope, that's why I wrote this article because this yep. sucks. It sucks to be like, wow, I lost so much weight that everybody looks at you and they go, oh my God. You're somewhere between absolutely stunning and sick. Are you trying to be a model? And you're like, actually, I can eat three foods, but thank you for commenting on on my existence. Right. So, trying. you know, just constantly trying to put the goodness out in the world, even when it's not necessarily always good for me. No, so. uh, C.S. Lewis says we read to know we are not alone. And I've always said we write to let others know they are not alone. And, you know, yes. and, and so I think, yes, you know, even though the, the Harrigan monk thing might not feel like it really is you, you are lucky for other people. So, yeah, I think that's perfect. Aww. Yeah, that's I think that's. Per OK, so now you're a Harrigan monk and you've been ambushed. You're walking through the forest and you've been ambushed by three level one goblins, just level one goblins. What do you do? OK, so. Obviously, I just start smacking them with my cane because that's, you know, what else are you going to do? But then anytime they get too close, I just bounce back, heal myself, and then I just rinse and repeat until they go away. Um, Because yeah. that's how one must play. That's I feel like that's how I play the world, too. Yeah. Is I just, like, am constantly, like, no, won't deal with you, and then retreat to, like, take care of myself, you know? And then go back out into the world, even if it's a positive experience into the world. I go out, and then I come back home. 
and do my own self healing yeah. and self care and then go recharge back. battle recharge battle yes, yes that really is that's perfect yes <laughs> that's great <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to go to our ad break. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Elle about what you've been daydreaming about. Today's episode is brought to you by the all-new merch store at notapipepublishing.com. Of course, the site has books and books and more books, but we also have merch like t-shirts and hats and art prints. My apologies to YouTube viewers, but podcast listeners, imagine a far more handsome t-shirt model telling you, I just got this new shirt, which shows a ghost saying, boo is Latin for I shout. Seriously, look it up. You're welcome. We have hats with the logo from Unrelenting by Jesse Hennard and Marie Parks, the logo from our Stories Within Anthology, and stickers that show Justice Sotomayor saying, respectfully I dissent with the respectfully crossed out because she chose to omit that in her response to the court's recent homophobic ruling. And there are art prints by Michaela Thorne, the artist and author of Tooth and Claw. Check out all the great merch at the store and use the code SHOWFAN for 10% off your entire order. All that's in the show notes. Also, we're always on the lookout for great guests and advertisers. So if you have a book or other product to sell and you're looking for a group of the most intelligent, witty, discerning readers, let us help you make that connection. Our ad rates are as low as 15 bucks and guests will never pay to be on the show. Right, Doug? We, we agreed on that. We only have guests we want to talk to. Some jerk offers us a billion dollars to be on the show. No way. Take a hike. Keep your billion, Elon. Stuff it in a pillow and hug it and cry because you're not cool enough to be on this show. Them's the breaks. You too, J.K. Rowling. Get your hateful, racist, transphobic ass out of here. You can't buy an empathetic soul with that billion dollars, and it won't get you on this show either. The rest of you, make Writers Not Writing a part of your marketing plan today. And we're back. Uh, so, L, what's something you've been daydreaming about lately? So kind of an odd thing to say daydreaming, but kind of like how disabled people are moving about the cabin. So uh, maybe that's always why I choose a healing class because I am honestly a beast healer in video games. Like if there's a healer you want to be on my team, I will be your pocket healer. If you don't know what that phrase is, Google it. If you do, you know, just like hook me up on Steam. We will play together. Um, so in reality, obviously, I can't heal myself or anyone around me. Um, a friend of mine and I are setting some time away every month to work on what we can do um, in our area. We're making um, a disability organization. Um, <clears throat> I won't say the world that we're trying to conquer, obviously. We're starting with Portland and um, education. And so for me, that's my biggest thing that I'm daydreaming about. I'm daydreaming about making this little tiny nugget of an organization into something big and beautiful. Um, we are really excited. We have like three prongs. We're going to work with um, creatives and um, schools, <coughs> excuse me, and um, businesses where we're hopefully going to, you know, get into businesses and show them kind of what they're doing wrong with buildings and where they're putting their money and that kind of thing. Um, we want to raise disabled voices while we do it. So hopefully everybody that will be working with us for pay as soon as we can, and anyone that can volunteer uh, as soon as we can pay them, we will. But those will also only be disabled voices and people with trauma if they're interested. Um, so I guess, yeah, I'm just sitting with what activism can look like for someone like me, mm -hmm. which is very different because I can't just storm the gates. Um, and working on my POA, which if you're not familiar, that's plan of action. It's a military speak. Um, but also the best way to buy teeth without buying them on Etsy, where they're like $100 a piece or some nonsense. So like, where are people getting them? Uh, my dentist said no. Another dentist also said no. So I guess I'm accepting donations. If any of you know where to buy teeth, um, it will be for a good cause. Are you well, focused on exclusively human teeth or would you take non-human teeth? I will take non-human teeth. Okay, I will, I'm wondering, I will accept, yeah, if animal teeth accept, might be easier to acquire. I will accept acquire. all teeth, all teeth. They are they are being used for um, projects. Um, my particular project <clears throat> is actually about, um, I'm doing a massive um, art installation collection about um, my disability. Each 
piece is going to be focused on a different um, one of my disorders. And there are a lot of them. So <laughs> I need a lot of teeth. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if you find them, you know, find me on Insta and just yeah. like tell me how to get some teeth. But yeah, so those are my two days. Are you thinking right like now. gallery style installation for that? Um, well, they're actually a lot of them are going to be really small because they're miniatures, um, miniature sized. Um, some of them are as big as my head, but that's about it. I do not know what I'm going to do with it when it's done. I would love to see it in a gallery, but I also know mm -hmm. that like this area is super swamped with um, people doing art things, especially paintings, which are really massive. People really love that. However, because it is disability and I am going to be working with um, our disability company, it's possible that I could just have it as part of another event just in the corner. So we'll see what it ends up being, but it's... It's a big project because, you know, I, I like to say that I'm collecting the letters of the alphabet because I have so many uh, things. I think we're at, ooh, 13, 15. And each one of those is like a very, very specific kind of piece. One involves me actually finding each individual object. And I think I want to find like 10 objects and I'm only finding them in the woods when I go on walks. So, you know, it's, it's a slow labor of love because I want it to be very organic. So I have no idea when it will be done, but we'll see. There is a grant opportunity for a particular uh, uh, gallery in Portland that they, they do an annual thing where it's, uh, you know, for artists, but also like people incorporate poetry. So they're, they're, you know, it's, it's art and, and, and written text. And, uh, but you've got to use within your art, stuff that you find i think they take a field trip as a group to a dump and it's all about repurposing things that have been discarded and so i'll see if i can find that and email it to you because i i've looked into it i'm like oh i love doing that kind of art and i'm like yeah but you have to live in portland uh so yes yeah, so I'll, I'll see if i can find that but uh yeah you'd be I don't live in that. portland yeah. i live in vancouver I don't know. I think maybe you might be in the area. I know I'm too far outside of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll see if I yeah, can send it to me. That. Anyhow, I'm, 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 I'm interested. Yeah, that would be very cool. I also love this uh, idea about the, the disability rights group. And I am working on something about how do we get more authors into schools? So let's connect on that, because that would be really, you know, I, I've, I've got the, some school connections and I would love to bring you into schools and talk about how do we write you know, uh, uh, you know, work directly with students about, because I think, I think talking to students about how do you write characters who are appropriate is also a way to help them see, and how do you see people in the world in a real way, you know, in an empathetic way. And, and so, yeah, I think that'd be really wonderful. So yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll connect on that for sure. Love that. So, uh, what's one thing you want listeners to know about what's going on with you and your career right now? Um, so I might as well announce the upcoming Immaculate Conception. Or do I say that it's mine? No, that doesn't sound right. Um, I woke up one day and like, wow, there's a baby. Like Rosemary Cordelia style. It's like super big. Mm, I'm not saying this right. Anyhow, I'm worried that the hubs is going to be mad that there's a baby in me right now. So I'm telling you, how's your response? This way I can uh, maybe tell him or not. Like, I can't show it to you because that gets awkward. So, you know, how do you feel is the question. Mm. Sit on that and then you can let me know post show. How do we feel about random babies showing up? I'm just, it's curious. Um, But anyhow, so I write books. That's uh, that's what's really that's what I'm really interested in. Uh, they're dark and challenging and about as weird as what I just told you. Um, so, some are sad. Um, <laughs> others are a bit comical. No, they actually don't have um, spontaneous babies because I don't usually write a lot of sci fi. <laughs> um, but usually they actually they just tell me what they're going to be. I don't get to choose. Um, I published one earlier this year, which is kind of the basis for a lot of the the like it's the basis of my workshop about disability um it's called another elizabeth it's about a disabled female serial killer um was really satisfying to write she actually has one of the issues i do hypermobile ehlers stanlos syndrome um it was it's gotten really great reception from actually the eds community as well as just 
other people who were like, wow, I didn't know this was a thing. And one person, my favorite quote was, I can't believe I'm saying this. We need more disabled serial killers. And I was like, yes, thank you. Yes, yes we do. Perfect. This is the best. Um, So, yeah, I just, I couldn't really ask for more excitement than that. And yeah, I guess that's the... Yeah, that's well, that's my biggest like hooray! I uh, I've already told you about the short story collection, which is called "We Used to Be Different." I don't know if I mentioned the title we earlier. Used to be different, okay. Well, and I have not read another Elizabeth yet, but I read your previous book, which was titled. I've got a signed copy here. What was your first one? Uh, the first one was called "I Never Stopped." I never stopped. That's right. There it is. Uh, and uh, so I can tell listeners the two things that I just uh, admire so much about your writing, first of all, the prose is just beautiful, like just beautiful phrases. But the thing that I love the most is the characters are so real, they stick with you. And that's one of those things that, uh, you know, not all, you know, there, there are characters where I'll read about them and then go, oh, I forgot that character exists. And the the both the main pr protagonists of that one are are memorable, you know, these, these wonderful characters. So folks out there, read Elle's stuff. So good. And now I need to read another Elizabeth because I'm, I'm excited about that. And then we used to be different. We'll be out uh, soon. So, okay, we'll have to check those out. Okay, so each week I run a weekly poll uh, online and, you know, ask the the, the viewers out there uh, for uh, their, their take. What should be our weekly poll this week? Mm. Sporks. Yes or no. Or only if you end up with the crappy plastic ones from bad fast food takeout places. Okay, so the option is Yes, I would be willing to use them anytime. No way, never. And you got it at a takeout place. You're gonna yes, okay, yes. The 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 in between position. Okay, I, I we'll put that out there. Sporks. Huh? Ooh, and what's yours? What's your answer? My answer on sporks. I do not like them. Um, I think I agree. I think I would use one in uh, the the you know the, the, the takeout. That's what you got. I'd use it. In fact, I got I had Indian yesterday, and I think there was a spork with the uh, uh, tiki masala, and that was you know and, and, you know I, I reluctantly used this spork. I felt like oh, I'm I'm doing I'm sure I'm doing this wrong. It's only supposed to really be the naan and the and the rice and the you know and I'm using this thing that is not in any way traditional to anywhere. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I did use it. So yeah, maybe a, I'm a reluctant, uh, uh, user in the takeout place, but any other time? No, not as, how about you? Where, where would you go with that one? I have actually like consciously been looking for nice metal sporks. I find them very entertaining. Would I seek them out when they're in the drawer? I can honestly say, I don't know, but I still want like two, really good sporks with like nice smooth handles i don't know and it could be you know to be fair i could be judging them based on the fact that if i'm only using the plastic ones then i think of them as this is this thing that breaks you cannot <laughs> use it as a fork with any force or it's just going to break on you but a metal spork might just be a lot more practical like it now just, it's... it seems like it could be really solid for that like you know you're having the stew right and then there's just like that one piece at the bottom and you can either have this massive chunk or you can just tear it in half with the little spork in like the little fork bit and See, then now it makes me wonder if we should maybe just replace all spoons with sporks i have thought that many times like it's just a little bit more versatile like now oh I'm gonna have to contemplate this one. This one will be, uh, yeah. This one will be. We'll, we'll we'll have to see where folks go on this one. This this one might be deeper than I thought. I know, right? <laughs> it is not my question. I I I heard it long, long time ago. I will not try to analyze how many years because then it will age me. But a long time ago, when I actually still ate fast food, someone was real intoxicated and was like, "Should we like have these in our cabinet or something?" Yeah. And I was like. Cabinet's not the right word, but I get the question. Oh, this, is, this is a weird moment, but I, I, I have questions myself now. Now, well, and I'm thinking I've, I've got one of these like multi-tool things that has a spork in it as, you know, like you're out camping and it's, some, you know, and, and it is a metal one. And I don't know that I've ever used it. And I'm like, maybe I should experiment with just eating with that. Ooh, for a report period of time. Back. Report back if you do. Yeah, I'd love to just hear. take it with me everywhere I go. How weird would I be? Like I'm at lunch at school in the you know the teachers' lounge, and I just pull out my own emergency tool that's got a spork, and I'm like, no, I only use sporks now. 
this is my new, you know, like my variation on it. being kosher or halal. I only use sporks. <laughs> I support that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Yeah, just just to see the reactions might be pretty great. Maybe I will give that a try. <laughs> so what is in your to read pile right now? Or what is one of the things in your to read pile right now? Um, So I have a really lengthy to read pile. It's actually kind of absurd. One thing that I'm really excited about um, that I have skipped on my Libby for um, a, lot of, a lot of months Um is the secret history. I'm really, really excited about that one. Um, and I just got the dream house. I just got that on Libby uh, because someone told me that it's nonfiction and I didn't know that. Um, mm-hmm. And that each chapter is apparently written in a different style of fiction, even though it's nonfiction. So I'm, I'm excited about that one. And I'm hoping that I will find the like 74 billion hours to read the secret history because I've been wanting to read that since the very first time I heard it. So I haven't even heard about this. Who's this by? Which one? The secret house or the secret, the secret history. Uh, that is Donna Tart. Donna Tart. Okay. The secret history. It's is it like, is it like, yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty big. It came out around the same time as, um, uh, um, American Psycho. It's like uh, she went oh, okay. to school with him, so they're they're all very like high caliber, talented people. It's um a suspense and um, what is that term that everyone loves to use with the a dark academia? So it's like a dark oh. academia suspense, but before that was a thing. So it's like a little higher brow and for adults. Um, it's been recommended to me by just about everyone. So it's. It's the secret. It sounds amazing. And one of yeah. the people that I trust the most with uh, book recommendations, he doesn't even read genre fiction. And he's like judging me for not having read this, <laughs> which almost makes me not want to read I it. I know. Yeah. That, I mean, but I, at that, the same that, time, I'm like, it's a bit of a turn off. I mean, the, the, the people who are snooty about genre fiction, I just am like, are you kidding? So much of what you love as literature is absolutely genre fiction, and you've decided it's not so that it falls into your literary category. It's like once something is promoted out of genre fiction, then it becomes literature. I'm just like, that's garbage. This is the fine literature is full of different genres. So like that's, you know, but uh, but yeah, so this he, one is one that to, you know, to this snooty. person's mind qualified. Yeah, he's not snooty, though. I do know someone who literally, as I I was telling them about my first suspense book, I was so excited. I was writing a suspense book. They look at me and they go, I don't know if like genre fiction is like really, I don't know. You know, it's just not as, I don't want to say quality, but and I was like, I am what's happening in this conversation. I think I should extricate myself. Is that the right word? Did I use a big enough word for you? Because right. I feel like this is negative. <laughs> and I, I feel like somebody. anything I say next, maybe will show the very large and also very small vocabulary that I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's getting smaller. <laughs> yeah, and no, I dated this woman one time who was like, I. she was a just a voracious reader, but she was like, I don't read science fiction. And then I was going through her, like her favorite books and it was, you know, 1984, uh, you know, <laughs> it was like, the, you know, A Handmaid's Tale. And I was like, you read science fiction. It's just that when you like it, you stop thinking of it as science fiction. Like mm-hmm. you love sci-fi. You just don't like sci-fi, you know? And I was like, come on, this is, you know. And so then, you don't like like high sci-fi or whatever you want to call it. You don't like, uh, you know, what is it? space operas? That doesn't mean yeah. you don't like Yeah, I think, I think it was like, you know, if, if there was like a pastel painting of somebody with a, you know, a, a laser blaster, then she'd go, that's sci-fi. And I'm like, no, no, sci-fi is a lot more encompassing and you love it. And she's like, and then, you know, to, to her credit, she was like, oh, you're right. If this is sci-fi, I love sci-fi. I was like, yeah, there's a lot of sci-fi you do love, you know, but I think we do. We put these things in these categories and then go, I don't like this entire category. I mean, I, I think about like for suspense, how many stories that are not strictly in the suspense genre require suspense of some kind in order to work? Like you want suspense. <laughs> That's part of building tension. So of course I literally want... just wrote that in um in a pitch about a workshop where I was like, um, I can write this. I mean, I can teach this as a suspense course for like suspense in the genre of like thriller and suspense, or I could just teach this as suspense 
is a thing that's needed in honestly so many books because it's about pacing and tense and and you know needing to keep your reader on the edge of their seat which even memoirs use so. yeah they ought to i mean you know yes there 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 is a place for the kind of story where it's like really low stakes you know this is this calming it's got no real tension in it some authors choose to go that way it's not my style it's not my kind of thing but just about everything i read i'm like no i do want it to get more suspenseful as it goes i want to be more and more invested you know and so those techniques cross over every genre so yeah that's I, i i would attend that workshop um so okay uh where uh can our listeners find you online i should always say online because I, every time i ask that question people are like please don't come to my house <laughs> like, i mean i can give you an address it will be fake yeah yeah yeah. and yeah, you have no, to give me no, five no, seconds no. to open up google to like give you a fake one <laughs> i'll give Somebody you like you my favorite like. coffee shop <laughs> yeah yeah um, where can folks find you online uh so instagram is like the place that i am most active on and it is e mitchell writes um just like it sounds and my website is the same thing, emitchellwrites.com. And you can find signed uh, paperbacks, ebooks, limited edition miniatures where you can buy and they're related to my books, which is super cool. And you can sign up for my newsletter. I send it out two times a month and it is filled with all sorts of fun stuff, including free stories and links to articles and, you know, lo-fi videos to like calm your week because- I'm a big fan of just giving you all the fun stuff. Um, And I've tinkered with threads. We'll see how long that lasts. But, you know, you can just hop on from Instagram to one, you know, you'll see. But that's where I'm at with threads. I'm like, maybe this will be a thing. I'll play around on it until we find out. But yeah, I will link to um, all those on the show notes, including uh, the newsletter. So folks sign up for that newsletter uh, right here on the show. So my next question is, Who's somebody else you think I should have on this show? Um, a weird, uh, a horror weird fiction author, uh, J.B. Kish. Oh, why would he be a good pick? Well, first off, he's a delight. Um, second, he's really, really funny. Um, and being a weird fiction author, I think that he would have some very, very fun answers to your questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. I will reach out to JB Kish. Uh, good, good, good pick. So before we get to our send off, I've got to thank some folks. Thanks to the artist, Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for our intro. I prefer the dusk. Uh, let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter at Max Oakland with three D's. Uh, and thanks to Halizna CCO for their song kids for the ad break. If you're in a band and you'd like your song used on the show, I would love to highlight a listener's work like Max's song, so email that to me. Thanks to Doug, the producer, for making the show sound good and taking the blame when it doesn't. And I cannot forget to mention Writers Not Writing is a production of Nautipipe Publishing, so please go to nautipipepublishing.com and check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. If you like this show, rate it and review it wherever you found it, and check out Elle's book and both the, the previous titles and the new one coming out, and give a review. That single click on that fifth star makes a huge difference to authors. So if you've got three minutes, make Elle's day. Uh, And then I'm too old to say smash that like button, but if you could gently tap on that like button for this show an odd number of times, I would greatly appreciate it. So uh, brings us to our send off. Elle, what would you want people to remember this week? Let's see. Make time to appreciate the little things. Your cup always feels fuller when you do. Totally agree. Uh, And I always say a book without spaces would be gibberish and our lives need spaces too. So don't ignore the spaces. And third, no matter how much you procrastinate, we're still proud of you. I love that.